So anyhow, I don't think this guy needs any more introduction, but Dave Kennedy was like the CISO for a Fortune 100, left that to start his own business, and now has a really awesome team doing penetration testing and all sorts of other fun stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and he's going to talk about some end user attacks. So everyone, welcome uh, Dave Kennedy. Thanks, Chris. Chris no problem, man. No problem. What? Appreciate everybody coming. Um, you know, this talk is always fun because I get to kind of go through a lot of the different uh, war stories that we do and, and what works and what doesn't uh, kind of out there. Uh, just a brief history, I started Trusted Second Binary Defense. Um, if you look on the right hand side, I decided to be funny to hire a new employee, uh, Justin, and uh, you know, tell him that he had to kind of come into work and dress up to work the first day and we all ended up dressing up as, uh, as different, uh, you know, costumes and I ended up dressing up as like Batman or I was a Ghostbuster, that's right. And then one of the guys on the left decides to dress up as Pennywise as a clown. Uh, and I didn't know it until I was driving down the street to go to my office and I look over to my right and he's right there and, you know, and he's, this car is right next to me and he's just smiling like this. You know? <laughs> it's one of those things that jacks you up and you never get over it. It's just, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I'll go into some of this other stuff. But um, you know, for me, when you look at, at where we're at today, I mean, if you look at a lot of the attacks that are happening out there, they really are originating from the human element or going after individuals. And it's funny because um, you know when Chris decided to start socialengineer.org before he even even you know start, started his own company and all those other things, you know Chris and I were in a, a chat room on IRC, and this is kind of how the social engineer toolkit and everything else got kind of started. And Chris and I were were good friends, and that's a whole other story in, in itself how we became friends. Um, and actually, the, the the heat story, the heater story, uh, he was mad at me and wouldn't even talk to me. And I, this was like a sign of offering. I was going to take him out to dinner and apologize for everything. That's when I had modified the seats to my car to burn his, burn his rear end. So that was like our peace offering, and then I ended up burning his rear end. So, you know, we ended up becoming really good friends that way. He told me, he sent me the worst websites on the internet because I went into the backtrack for him asking for help. And he goes, Oh, you want help with this internet? You're a network card on a Dell? I said, Yeah. He goes, Go to this link. And it was, I'm not even going to tell you what, the worst stuff you can imagine ever seeing. Well, <laughs> The funny part about Chris is he starts, you know, he's like, oh my God, and he starts hitting the X button to close out real quick, and he closes his IRC chat room, right? And so he comes back in like 15 minutes later, and he's like, I don't know who that was, but some real big idiot, you know, was on this website, and he sent me to this really bad website. I'm like, dude, don't worry, we kicked him. You know, everything's fine, just go to this other website, it'll help you out. <laughs> right. Got him a second time. And then, and then we were at ShmooCon and, you know, Chris wanted to beat me up and I'm like, Chris, listen, man, I'm sorry, you know, I got, I didn't have kids this time. I'm like, hey, man, you know, uh, I got kids and everything. I'm like, here's a picture of them. And it was the same site and then I ran away, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how Chris and I became good friends. But uh, I homed in. I, I knew Chris was a special case and they needed to home in on him and treat him a little bit differently than others. But. Uh, you know, what's interesting um, with all of that though, it, you know, Chris was in a chat room, you know, he's like, hey man, I really think that uh, social engineering and coupling technology is going to be a real big thing. And this is like 2006. And uh, I'm like, yeah, I agree with you. Let's start like a little thing together and let's like figure out social-engineer.org and we can kind of get a group going. And that's kind of how SET ended up becoming uh, created. And that's how we created the social engineer toolkit. And uh, so it's interesting to see how all of these attacks have kind of evolved because if you look at the past year and a half, the majority of them come down to phishing. They come down to targeting individuals and human beings and they, they, it's really a successful um, you know, uh, endeavor and it's really, you know, if you look at, at an attack, it's a really low, I don't, th I don't think I can go that far over, it starts ringing. Um, attacks are a um, low, low investment, high you know, impact of what you actually do. So you don't need someone that's heavily sophisticated or somebody that's really good at what they do as far as um, attacking. You don't have to be a zero day researcher. You can get everybody the way that you want to right now and it's, it's pretty easy to do. And I'm going to show you a demonstration and, and if you've seen this I apologize. Um, but it's a, a thing that I did on the Katie Couric show and it's, it's really resonant because literally I was um, going on the Katie Couric show and Katie asked me, she's like, hey, can you just hack somebody live in the audience and then we'll, we'll videotape their reaction. You know, me being a hacker, I'm like, heck yeah I can. I'm going to steal all of her stuff and I'm going to do this. I'm going to grab her social security number and all this. And, and I was all like happy and excited about what I was doing but I didn't really realize the impact that it had, you know, on this individual. So I'm going to show you a quick, quick demo of what I did on the uh, Katie Kirk show. And just a heads up, I, uh, so what you're, who you're going to see is, is Big Dave. I'm Little Dave. I've lost about 115 pounds since I last went on the Katie Kirk show about a year ago. So this is uh, Little Dave. Um, thank you. It's amazing what eating less and working out can do for you.
I turn it up. I caught him sleeping. Is here. She has two teenage daughters. She lives in Connecticut. Can you get up a little Stephanie, more? I understand that you believe your computer is unhackable. Why? All right. Here Schmidt is here. She has two teenage daughters. She lives in Connecticut. And Stephanie, I understand that you believe your computer is unhackable. Why? Well, uh, I'm, it's something that's really on my mind. I'm very concerned about it. I, I feel like all of my antivirus software is up to date. I've taken a lot of precautions. I have a computer consultant who comes into my home. So, wait, first of all, does anybody you know in your family have a computer consultant that comes in their house to like make sure that they're, you have a couple? Wow, that's amazing because I've never heard of one. So I'm like, Katie picks the only person in the world that has a computer consultant that's gonna lock her computer down. So I'm like, all right, well, I gotta start whipping out some zero days or something like that for this one, but we'll see. To check on these things. And so I really feel strongly that, that we have done everything that possible to try and protect my, myself and my daughters. I mean, it's something that's really worrisome for me. Well, that, that's very impressive because you seem like you're extremely ahead of the curve. So we decided to put David to the test to see if your comfort level with your security is actually warranted. Tell us what happened. How did you do when we gave you the challenge of... So right there, you know. <laughs> oh so... To kind of show how I feel at this point in time, because I'm confident in what I'm doing, I'll, I'll, actually, I got a little uh, little video I can show you how I feel, and I I like a little animal meme, so this is this is a good one here. That's, that's kind of how I felt at that point in time. <laughs> I felt pretty good, right? To Stephanie's computer. So, you know, Stephanie, I would say, was actually one of the, the top 5% of what I would say is being most secure. Um, you know, everything up to date, really locked down, all of those good things. And um, so I literally had plugged in, opened my computer up, and less than 10 minutes or so had a fully designed uh, website that looked real in every way and shape or form of a website that you would visit every single day. And I sent an email out, and uh, as soon as I sent the email out, it looks very believable in every way. Uh, she clicked a link, um, and then from there, again, less than 10 minutes of setup time and hacking and all that stuff, I had full access uh, to her computer, uh, her webcam, got around all of her antivirus, everything completely. You are kidding me. Wow. So, you know, as a hacker at this point in time, I'm like, <laughs> I'm still doing the, you know, I got everything, right? You know? And then I don't even think about what I'm doing. I'm just like, hey, man, I just own everything we you have here, you know? So tell us oh some my of the gosh. things that you were able to see. Well, the first thing we did is we, we enabled her. Why not enable her webcam and spy on her in her house? Oh, my uh, God. That's my we enabled her webcam. And we were actually able to monitor everything that was going on in her house, everything from her daughter uh, working on her computer uh, to Stephanie actually walking through the house itself. Uh, we actually enabled the audio as well, so we can. So we enable our audio and turn it into a tap device as well, too, so we can listen to conversations. You know, it sounds all good. We hear everything that was going on at the same time, uh, so we can listen to conversations. Um, from there, you know, we started looking at um, a lot of. I won't let it keep going; it gets worse. But um, <laughs> to say the least, you know, that was one of those moments where, like, you know, you realize like how impactful you are as an attacker and like the the uh, you know effect it can have on an individual and. You know, the thing is, you know, for me to attack Stephanie, it took about 10 minutes of time. Um, you know, literally, I went on her website, I checked, uh, you know, her Facebook profile, her Twitter profile, saw that she, uh, at one point in time, like a year and a half ago, made a mention about an Amazon package delivery. So I just, you know, cloned Amazon's website, you know, I made a quick, uh, you know, um, uh, package distribution page, and I, I sent her an email saying, hey, you know, Stephanie, just so you know, your package re was rerouted due to a, uh, you know, inclement weather changes or whatever. Please click here when you can schedule a new delivery. And as soon as she clicked the link and compromised her computer, right? So it took about 10 minutes to set all that up and hack her, her stuff. And it's something that is, you know, may seem stupid, but it works really well because I know that she shops at Amazon, right? So whenever you can establish some sort of trust with somebody, you have the ability to attack them in some way that is very personal that they expect. And that's what attacking humans are all about. It's about going after them in a way that you create a fantasy that's completely ridiculous, but it's believable to them. And uh, what was interesting is, um, so you'll see something that's coming out soon uh, with CNN, and it's not public yet, 
Um, but I did a live hack on, on you know, where I went after a company and I compromised, and it, the company gave me permission to do this. But I did, you know, I called the help desk up and, you know, I spoofed my phone number coming from inside of the company and I said, hey, just so you know, I'm, I'm having this weird problem getting to this website for this specific, you know, site itself. And they're like, oh, how can I help you? Because the help desk is supposed to help, right? I'm like, can you just go to this website and make sure I'm not an idiot, you know, and, and you know, that it's not my computer? And he's like, yeah, yeah, what's the website? You know, and I just go, you know, www.whateveritwas.com. As soon as they go to the website, it compromises the machine and I have full access to that help desk person's computer, right? So, but that's what they're designed to do. That's their function is to help. So if you can attack somebody in a way that is believable to them, that is understandable to them, and it doesn't trigger any barriers or misconceptions around something that's wrong, then it works, right? And it works really, really well. The things that you run into is when you don't spend your time to research a company and go after them, and you just do something that's like, hey, health benefits, or hey, this or that, you actually got to spend some time looking at who you're going after uh, to target things, and I'll talk about that. And I got a cool example of one we just did recently, which is really neat. So, uh, you know, the, the premise of, of social engineering attacking humans is make something that's so believable to them that they're going to believe it and that it's not going to trigger any alarms, right? And really, it just comes down to normal human behavior. If you're like, hey, I'm a Nigerian prince, you need to get $10 million if you click this link, no one's going to believe that, right? It's ridiculous, right? However, if I do my research on an individual and I know that they're in a specific department in a specific organization, perfect example, sales, right? Actually, you don't even need to do research on sales, right? You can do anything you want to to sales. Like, hey, I, I'm going to buy from you. I got like $5 million. Can you tell me what antivirus you have? Well, that's kind of that's weird. But yeah, I'm, I'm using Symantec. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Can you just type a couple commands like Telnet to this? I'm still going to get the sale, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay cool. What am I doing here? Okay, yeah, okay, sweet. Hey, I just saw some flag of virus. Oh, I just right click and hit the save. Okay, cool. I'm still getting the sale, right? You know, what's interesting with um, people you target specifically, um, especially like sales, like if, you, if they're an organization that's business to business, like going out and talking to other businesses, creating a fake business that's in their demographics in their market is perfect. Like create a fake website that looks like a business that they would sell to you. And then you call them up and you're like, hey bro, I got $15 million and I got, I got, I got three days I got to burn it before my, Q end, my, my Q3 ends. I got to burn this $15 million in three days. Is there any way you can work with me? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Everybody drops. You got the whole sales support staff. You're like, boom, fish him, fish him, fish him, fish him, shell, 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 shell. Because you got the whole support staff, you know, just compromising everything, right? So, you know, you have to build your attacks off of a way that's going to be believable. And I'll show you an example of that here in just a second of, of some things that we did. And for us, you know, being a hacker um, is really about being and thinking outside of the box. You know, what's funny about um, when I first started in this industry, right, I started on that, that zero day route, which is like, you know, building exploits and bypassing SLR and DEP and ROP and all this other stuff. And I still do some of that, but it's hard. Like building exploits nowadays, if you don't like focus on it, it's really hard to do. For me, social engineering is that same type of excitement and fun because it requires you to put a puzzle together to figure things out in a way that you wouldn't before and, and, and come and, and, and figure out how you can attack somebody in a way that is unique. And it's literally like crafting your own zero day, right? It's like literally trying to get around ROP and putting a puzzle together because you have to put a puzzle of a human being together which is way more complex. I mean, human beings act so crazily different depending on who you are or demographics or southern accents or British accents or females. You saw women have a much higher probability in social engineering and destroy based on culture. There's so many different things and variables that come into attacking a human. It's so fascinating to me. So we have to, you know, mature as an industry to do that because that's exactly what the attackers are doing. And you know, what's interesting about pen testing, right? You, you hear a lot about pen testing and pen testing and pen testing. The thing about pen testing is that it doesn't really simulate an actual attack against an organization. It's like, hey, we're going to compromise this thing and then we're going to get domain name in and then we just owned everything and we're going to write a report on how we got domain name in. Here you go, boom, right? It doesn't simulate an adversary. It doesn't simulate an attacker. It doesn't simulate anything that's going on. It's really just, um, sorry, this kid's here. Oops. Um, forget about that one. Sorry, I forgot about that one. It's the only one in there that's bad. Um, so we have to move more towards what we call objective pen testing to me and that's really trying to understand what the business does, how they operate and how can I attack that. Like for example, manufacturing companies. Does anybody here do work for manufacturing companies or work in a manufacturing type, type organization? Is the actual product they make what's sensitive to them? No. But how they built that? the process around it and how they, the chemical compounds and their, their suppliers that they source it out to and the hundreds of years that they've taken to mature the specific product, that's the intellectual property and that's what they're going after right now. Same thing for let's just say retail. 
Credit cards and customer information is number one, right? That's, that's, that's a given. If you start going into other demographics like medical research or you know, the skate, is, skate infrastructure and energy sectors and things like that, right? Every single um, organization is unique in how they are unique as a, or how they are uh, different as a company. So it requires us to actually attack them in a different way that makes it some way in uh, shape or form simulating what's actually going to happen out there. So I talked about this but you know if you look at what's kind of happening in the media right now, this is what's I guess the scariest thing to me is that uh, companies that have neglected security forever, right, now can claim that they were hacked by China and that it was sophisticated and all the years of neglect they now have an out, right? So we haven't funded security for 10 years. We haven't given it the right path and it hasn't been structured in our organization. And some folks fished us with the most horrible fish ever and we fell for it. And, and, and all we have is antivirus on our endpoints and that's it. And we get compromised. It was a sophisticated attack and we're not to blame for this. And that is a big issue for the security industry because it's not going to mature us and make us better. It's just another thing that we can blame uh, you know, to make things happen. And what's interesting is if you actually look at most of the attacks that have happened, there are sophisticated attacks that happen out there. There's no question about it. If you look at like the Sony stuff with North Korea, right? You know, North Korea, that stuff, that malware was pretty rudimentary, right? It, it dropped like six or seven different types of pieces of binaries on there. It looked like something out of like 1982. So if you can code like four lines of bash, you're now a sophisticated attacker in today's world. But it's, it's everywhere. It's not, it's not Sony's default to that. It's everywhere. Every single organization has the same problem but we now have a crux for it and, and, and a way to blame other things that happen. And we didn't really see that with something like Target, right? Target, you know, they had the ex executives fired and everybody else out there because they lost all their credit card data. Even though they probably had a much better security program than almost anybody else out there at the time. So, you know, it's a different um, type of world we live in now because we can just blame things on attackers. You can blame things on, on someone being sophisticated and doesn't necessarily um, make a change. Now I'm going to show you uh, uh, or walk you through an example of a, a test I did recently. I'm going to show you some cool stuff too. Um, but we went after a manufacturing company recently. It was, it was what we call a red team engagement, right? So it's like no holds barred, right? You can do whatever you want to. And when I say whatever you want to, it's not like you can like walk up and hold somebody up at gunpoint or anything. But it's like you can pretty much do anything you want to, aside from like breaking stuff. Probably not a good idea. Um, but the main focus of this was to focus on their next generation product line or their R&D stuff, right? So what they're going to be doing in the future. And we had been doing work for this company for, for a couple of years and it really focused on protecting their IP and focused on protecting the research and development of their next gen products. So it was really, really important to them that, you know, to see if we can actually get access to it. And so we had any method that we could possibly use, right? We could do physical, we could do social engineering, we could hack anything we want to, we can do whatever we want to. It was, it was a full scope, right? It allowed us to do any type of thing that we wanted to actually do. And so what we decided to do is, you know, hey, maybe we can go fishing first. But before we do fishing, Maybe we can look for something first to kind of help us out with it because in order to get to some of these people, we're going to have to get pretty deep. And so we started looking and we found an uh, actual web application that had a file upload vulnerability in it which allowed us to compromise a website. Okay? We compromised this website but we didn't really have permission to do anything. It was like you know, kind of locked in its own DMZ, didn't really, couldn't do any type of lateral movement or attacks or anything like that. So it was really difficult for us to attack the system. But what we could do is create our own web pages. And so we could create a web page on a company or organization's web page, right? Which does what? Trust and, and credibility, right? So establishes credibility and trust for a specific website because we have already owned the specific website. So what we ended up doing is we, we made this whole website and we sent it out to a couple of individuals in the sales department. And we ended up getting one of them like almost right away. So you know, we had to log into this website, right? And we, we grabbed credentials. We didn't want to trigger anything yet so we didn't like go for compromising a system because we didn't know what defenses they had in place. And so at this point in time, we had to figure out a way to actually go and attack them. And we, what we did is, you know, we, we you know, fished them with a specific uh, fish, logged with username and password, and it was like a survey they went through and did some, certain things. So what's great about Outlook Web Access, for some reason, corporations, um, they'll, they'll do two factor VPN, you know, so if they do a, like a one time pen or something for VPNs, but OWA for some reason is like always open. There's never any two factor authentication, which is horrible because it has access to all of your, you know, email and exchange data and everything else that's going on. And so it was interesting with this is when we compromised um, the sales individual, does anybody know what happens when you compromise an OWA infrastructure, like just a one user? Even more trust, right? Because you have conversations with people that have already been talking to you. So usually what I do when I compromise OWA is I'll sit there for like two or three hours just reading through emails, just seeing which one is the perfect one for me to be able to send something back to him, right? And send something that's horrible. Well, not horrible. I mean, it's like good for me, but 
I mean, not like what I did to Chris. Um, but, you know, send something back to an individual salesperson that establishes another part of, part of trust and compromises the machine. And so, you know, um, what we had to look at is, you know, we ended up doing what was called an Excel injection. And I'll show you a quick demo of this really quick. Now, is anybody familiar? Has anybody used the, the tool Unicorn before? A couple people, it's great. Um, if you haven't seen it, the new version 2 is out, uh, which came out about two or three weeks ago. And it has a lot of new uh, attack vectors in it, um, improved optimization of code. Metasploit, um, they get, got a much larger payload, so that like whenever you generated payloads within Metasploit, it became much larger. And if you know anything about PowerShell injection, you have to keep it kind of small and compact in certain things. So I was able to strip out a large percentage of the new payload um, systems, and so it's all in one. But if you're not familiar with PowerShell, um, so to put it in perspective, like every new operating system from Windows Vista and above has PowerShell installed on it. And PowerShell is a very um, specific type of attack vector because it allows you to um, basically do direct memory access and, and inject shell code directly into memory through PowerShell, which means that if you're using something like a bit9 or application whitelisting, you can circumvent that really easily and just inject your own shell code out there and never touch disk. And so I, I ended up creating Unicorn, uh, which allows you to attack 32 and 64 bit platforms natively uh, with it. And so one of the attack vectors that you can do now is um, through macro injection, which was a, 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 one of the, uh, some individual added it to um, a git pull request, which is really cool, and I've improved it since then. And what's nice about this, I just want to show you real quick. So any new hacker tool, by the way, um, has to have ASCII art as far as I'm concerned. So this has an awesome, <laughs> it was funny, one of the, um, I was teaching my black hat class, and uh, one of the, uh, the students was like, it'd be awesome if the unicorn had red eyes. So at break time I coded in red eyes, so it has red eyes now. Um, and it's, it's all fun. But um, Unicorn, what it does is it, it allows you to generate a, m a number of attacks. And so one of the ones that we're going to run really quick is, is the um, uh, macro attack. And so first we need a payload. So we're going to specify like Windows Meterpreter reverse TCP. And I'll just give it any type of IP address that I want to. And then I'm just going to specify macro, port macro. And it's going to go ahead and generate the code for us. And I use this all the time, and it's, it's so effective, especially if you have a trust relationship. And so I'll add, go ahead and edit this. And it generates um, macro code for you that does PowerShell injection natively. So when they open up the Excel document, it doesn't touch disk, it doesn't download anything else, it just injects shell code into memory for you. So it compromises the system, and it gets around a lot of the um, application while using type technology. So, and by the way, if you're using like what's called um, execution restriction policies, it doesn't matter because you're using what's called the encoded command uh, parameter. So it gets around any type of execution restriction policies that you have in place too. So if you're using all sign or remote sign or anything like that, um, it doesn't make a difference. And so that'll work. Um, you execute that, it compromises your machine, and then it gives you a shell out of the network, which I'll show you a demonstration here in just a few minutes. Um, but it works extremely well. Um, it's effective where I use a lot of the social engineering techniques. Uh, but what's interesting, though, is we hear a lot about the uh, you know, types of technology, like preventative measures that, that companies have, like next-gen firewalls and all this other stuff. Well, I ran into a, um, a specific virtualization technology. And I'm not going to talk about which one it is, because I don't necessarily like bashing vendors or anything like that. They all do what they can. Um, but I ran into a virtualization technology. Does anybody know how those type of technologies work? They, you know, a piece of malware comes in, right, or something comes in, and it doesn't look normal, right? They spin up in a virtual machine, right, and that virtual machine then looks at everything that's occurring. So it looks at the registry entries that gets made, the, the C2 type infrastructure, like if it's connect connecting out to the um, outside internet. Is it making changes to the operating system for persistence or other areas? It's, it's, it's a neat technology. So I ended up uh, sending this Excel document to the sales individual, and all of a sudden it didn't work, and I couldn't figure out why. And I was looking at it, and I could see the initial connection, but then after that it just died, and it wasn't coming from the actual computer. So I'm like, ah, they're using some sort of virtualization technology. So I need to take a look at how to get around that. So if you want to bypass sandbox technology, I'm going to release this today. It's extremely, you know, it's taken me months of research uh, development, but I'm releasing this today for you all um, so you can see, you know, um, how to get past uh, sandbox technology and all of them, which is great. Um, and it's extremely difficult, um, so I'm going to show you all of the code right here. Just kidding, it's not really hard. It's three lines of code to get, rid of, or get around virtualization technology. But um, it's, it's actually really bad. It's terrible. Um, so the virtual machines all use very predictable um, sandbox containers, right? And a lot of them, a lot of the big ones, will use two CPU cores or less, or usually just less than one. So does anybody you know use one CPU core at all in your environment? No, right? So if CPU core is less than two, then just don't do anything and exit. 
So when it comes into these sandbox technologies, right? It's like, hey, 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 are you doing anything? Oh, I'm in one CPU. Don't, don't do anything. Oh, you're not, do, you're not doing anything. You're good. Pass it off to the end user. It's cool, right? And they're like, oh, it came through, you know, this virtualization technology. I can double click it now. Everything's fine. Oh, I'm not in a one CPU environment. Okay, run the code and execute. Everything's good. I got my shell. So, um, yeah, it works for pretty much any major one. Uh, what's interesting, the reason why I talk about this, by the way, um, is it's now being baked into a lot of the malware that you see out there today. Like, uh, I know Dyer came out with it, and now Dyer um, actually has it built into the malware itself, so it actually looks for sandbox environments and does it. There's a whole bunch of different ways, though, um, to get around uh, virtualization and sandbox technology. This is just one of the many. Um, some people say time based delays work. Uh, we used to use time based delays for a while, but they've gotten a little bit smarter on that. Um, the, um, uh, the CPU core counts are extremely easy, um, and it works almost every time. There's a few other ones, too. So what was cool about that is, you know, we got past the virtualization technology and we compromised some boxes. Um, and, you know, we bypassed the sandbox technology. Um, you know, we ended up, like, looking at a lot of different areas that we can get in. Excel injection ended up working for us with the PowerShell injection, which was, which was awesome. So we had shells. We had access to, you know, a couple of individuals' machines, uh, most specifically one that we were specifically targeting that we, we really liked. So what was interesting about this attack is uh, they use proper network segmentation, right? Uh, which is really interesting to see. Most of the attacks that you see out there today is due to one person becoming compromised, right? Or maybe a couple people becoming compromised. And then that whole thing you hear about lateral movement, right? So they compromise one machine and then they spread out the rest of the network with information that they obtained from one system out to the other. Most companies kind of have an M&M &M syndrome, right? They're hard on the outside, soft on the inside. So once you get past that hard exterior and you go to the inside, you now have the ability to touch all the systems that you want, right? Well, what was interesting about this company is that they actually did pretty decent network segmentation, so it was really hard for me to even touch any of the individuals that were part of R&D. I couldn't even get to the R&D people that I needed access to, let alone get to the, the information that I needed access to to get it, which is really good. You know, you don't see a lot of companies doing that, which is, which is awesome. And so one thing I noticed is that um, on the, uh, when I was going through and, and attacking, one of the VLANs I was able to get access to had the physical security um, system on it. And, if you don't know much about physical security systems, like the physical security manufacturers are like so far behind the logical, I guess, um, folks that like usually breaking into physical security systems are really easy. And usually the physical security guys don't like, you know, handle good security practices in a lot of cases. Um, so we ended up um, getting into this intranet site that was their physical security website for the company. And it listed like how to make a badge, right? Like this is step one. So I went, I'm like, oh, okay. So I go to this website, I enter this username in, I enter this password in, right? And I'm in this, this, now this, this badging system, right? And it's like, next, if you need to create a new employee, make sure you assign the roles that he needs access to. So I created myself a badge, so David Kennedy gets a badge, right? And I'm like, oh, I need access to R&D. Oh, it has a pin? Okay, I'm going to set myself a pin. Cool. You know, and then I just like select all. I just, I just added myself to everything. So I'm like, select all and just hit OK, right? So I added it, I added all this and everything. And it said, you know, you know, usually the badge, you know, will print and everything, and it'll be ready for the the new employee to pick up. Usually within an hour or two, um, something like that. So I waited a day, and so I dressed up, you know, um, it's live footage. But I ended up uh, dressing up. You know, when you go to an organization, um, you want to play the part. You want to play who you're going to be going after. You don't want to arouse any suspicion. So this company specifically was more of like a you know tie type of company. So I had to wear a tie and everything. And I walk up to the front desk, and you know the security guard's sitting there and everything. I'm like, hey, I'm a new employee. I have a badge. My name's Dave Kennedy. And he's like, oh, okay. Oh, here you go. Here you go, Dave. Here you go. Sweet. Thank you. So I you know badge clip on. Bloop, you know exit in. And I'm walking in the building. Right. I mean, it's great. So so far so good. I'm at the point now where hey. You know, I got in through social engineering, kind of, but I didn't get all the way, but I used my, you know, initial method to get in. And so I started walking around and, and kind of, uh, you know, trying to find different areas and, and trying to see if I could find the R&D area. So I find the R&D thing. And, you know, like, uh, companies try to um, promote what they're doing as far as, like, research and development, right? So there's, like, this R&D center of excellence, and it's, like, you know, tinted windows and, you know, security access and all this other stuff, Right? And so I get to the, this, this area here, and like, you know, I'm in a tie and everything, and I get to this R&D center of excellence. I'm like, cool, I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to try to get into this environment, this network segment, so that I can hack the rest of the information that you get access to. And so I walk in there, and I don't know if you've ever been in a situation, like the clown situation, where I walked into a bunch of clowns, right? Like, you don't belong. Like, like I should not be in this room where there's a whole bunch of clowns, right? Same thing that happened this one. I end up badging, I hit my pin, I walk in, 
And it must have been like a, a massive R&D meeting. There's like 50 people in there. They all turn around and look at me and I'm in a tie. They're all in like jeans and a t-shirt. And they're all looking at me like, who are you and why are you here? So at this point, you have two choices, right? You're like, well, I can just back off and pretend nothing happened. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, wrong room, wrong room. Or you can be like, well, let's see what, let's see what happens and walk in. So I walk in, you know, and, and I just kind of go to the side a little bit and everybody's kind of looking at me and they go back to doing what they're doing, just, you know, standard business or anything. I guess they figure if, hey, if I have access to this, everything's fine, right? So I'm walking and I'm walking and walking and I'm, I'm trying to like focus on them and I'm trying to focus on the individuals and ended up uh, not seeing a, a trash can that's sitting there and I'm walking and I trip over this, this metal trash can, <laughs> right? And there's like, you know, there's like mustard all over me and food and everything and I literally hit it hard. Like, I mean, I hit it and I'm like rolling and, and being six foot four and being like, you know, starting to get into my, you know, mid thirties, when you fall hard, you fall hard, right? And you're sore for like three weeks afterwards and you got bruises everywhere and you're like, honey, I had a rough day at work today. And she's like, I thought you were a computer guy. Why do you have bruises everywhere? I'm like, you have no idea what I've been through. No idea. But, you know, what's funny is I make this huge noise in all this trash everywhere. Um, you know, people pick me up and everything like, oh my gosh, you okay? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm just going over here to try to get over here. Like, oh, okay, I'm so sorry this happened. You know, we'll, move the, we'll move the trash can. It's our fault. I'm like, no, no, it's my fault. You know, I'm trying to not cry, you know, because you know, it hurt, you know, a little bit. But uh, I get over to, to the side and I see a computer there and um, I'm going to be open sourcing this next week uh, uh, and it's uh, what I call it, uh, it's what we call our tap devices which um, if you're familiar with like Intel Nooks, the little Nooks, you can buy them for like 200 bucks or something like that. You go and you buy one of those and you get like 128 gig solid state drive, give it about 8 gigs of RAM and then you can also buy an LTE card for it that uh, fits in. And so what, we, what I did is I wrote um, some software and some code um, that will automatically establish a reverse SSH VPN. Uh, and Jeff also, one of our guys, ha um, is, is also back there, right? Jeff, raise your hand. Also wrote the SSH VPN part of it, so I can't take all credit for that. Um, but it basically establishes a reverse H uh, uh, SSH connection out of the LTE network while bridging the um, other network that might be air gapped. And then it does a reverse SSH connection in, and then you can VPN full, you know, full tap device through an SSH connection into that environment, so you have full access to that computer, uh, it's in full access to that network, and to, to get around it. And what's nice about um, the tablet devices and what I built is it's uh, kind of like self-healing. So if there's problems with the operating system or the connection, it automatically tries to repair itself so they it can get back out again. So like you know if something goes wrong, it tries to fix itself and re you know restore itself back to its original content. Um, so I'll be re releasing that. I've been working on it for actually about a year and a half, um, and I figured why not just open source it? It's been it's been a fun project. It's most of my stuff. That I, I like I'll get like halfway through a project and I'll forget about it, and then uh, you know I'll come back a year later and kind of figure it out. Um, but that's kind of how that works. Now what's interesting with the, the implants themselves, um, you know, and then when, when I open source the code is it, it will literally, um, we've never seen it fail in an environment that we get access to, physical access to, right? So, you know, it can do things like um, impersonate the network that it's going on to and automatically clone a MAC address um, so that you can get around a lot of the like 802.1x. It will also, I'm working on right now a module for it where it will actually sniff for um, like printer MAC addresses that are on the network and it will automatically change itself to one of those so that it gets into like the printer VLAN so you can at least get some access into an environment that may not have 802.1x uh, in place. So there's a lot more stuff that, that I'm adding to that which is, uh, which is really cool. I want to show you a quick demo here real quick. Then I'm going to ask, is, is, is Chris still around? I got a demo for you I want to check real quick here. Do I have your permission first? Can I, can I give your permission, Chris? I need your permission first. You just have to say yes. Would I I'm first steer you wrong? <laughs> but we'll, 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 wait, we'll wait a minute. I got a demo here to do first. And I have to see if I can still even get to it, but we'll try. So one of the attacks that I use a lot um, in social engineering is through the social engineering toolkit, right? And if you've used SET, um, SET is just a tool. All right? It's just a tool that can help you in what you're doing. If you're just running SET to run a tool, then you're not going to be successful. However, if you actually go after an organization and do your proper type of attack, you're going to be successful in how you do it. Now, one of the new attack vectors that I just added into the Social Engineering Toolkit, um, and special thanks to, to Justin uh, Elzy for, for even leading me onto this, is what we call the HTA tax. Um, if you're familiar with most corporations, they still traditionally use Internet Explorer, right? It's kind of their main method for browsing. I mean, compatibility, Oracle, everything else that comes along with the horribleness of Internet Explorer, right? Um, so what you can do, and this actually works in uh, Chrome and Firefox as well, um, 
but in most cases you're going to want to use this in, in IE is what we call HTA files. And HTA files are um, a separate launcher that gets added to um, Microsoft and it gets called. And it's kind of a similar problem that we saw with uh, Java applet attacks in the past. Uh, if you're not familiar, not familiar with Java applets, it's a way of basically compromising a machine very, very easily if you have Java installed. Doesn't matter what version, doesn't need to be a zero day or anything like that, it just always works. Um, but in this case, just how Java is just designed, right? <laughs> um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the social engineer toolkit. I'll show you how easy this is. And uh, this is version uh, 652. Uh, it just came out recently. Uh, what's interesting about um, this version is I named it Mr. Robot. Has anybody seen the show Mr. Robot? Yeah. Good stuff, right? What was interesting is uh, I was literally in bed sleeping, right? And I had Mr. Robot recorded. And I'm like in bed and I'm all snuggling and I got my, my, you know, my comforter on and I'm just getting ready to fall asleep. And all of a sudden my phone starts ringing and I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. It starts ringing again. I start getting text messages. And I guess, uh, you know, the social engineer toolkit was on Mr. Robot. So I actually used Mr. Robot to hack into someone's computer system through one of the SMS spoofing attacks, which is kind of neat. Um, so I actually got to see my tool used in a TV show on hacking into things. So I, you know, I named my next version Mr. Robot in, in honor of, of an awesome TV show, which is really sweet. But we're going to hit number one, social engineering attacks. And then I'm going to hit number two, the website attack vector. And then I'm going to do the Java applet attack method. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to do the um, HTA attack method, which is number eight. And so this is, a, this is a new attack vector that's in there right now. And then it's going to ask me for what my IP address is. So if I was actually doing this on the internet, I would give them my external IP address. And what port I want the payload. Uh, I'll use Meterpreter reverse TCP, but you can use whatever you want to. Now, when you're doing this attack, right, what I usually do is I'll use something like, uh, have you ever used RAR before? Great tool. RAR is great for reconnaissance. It's uh, W A W R. And what it does is it sweeps a whole um, externally facing network looking for like um, websites, right? And if you hit a customer's website and you look for those specific ports, you can see the website that's out there. You can start to kind of get an, uh, an idea of what, maybe what type of pretext you're going to use for an attack. And so you can kind of sweep the network looking for like a different website that may look somewhat believable that you might want to clone. And so I would go after that company's website, clone it, and make it look somewhat believable so that when I go after them, it's something that they're familiar with. So we'll go ahead and hit site cloner number two. And I'll go ahead and just clone trust the tech as an example. And it's going to clone the website. It's going to automatically generate um, the PowerShell injection code. It's going to automatically um, wrap it out and create everything for you in a web application uh, for the website. And then it's going to launch Metasploit for you for a, an actual listener. So it'll do all that for you automatically. And then we're ready to go for our attack. Well, next I would, you know, social engineer somebody, right, to go to this website and do things. And what's funny is, um, Martin, one of our guys on our team, uh, Martin Boss, was recently on a pen test and, oh, well, I got to update you. Oops. Uh, this is my hack box anyway. I don't care about it. Um, and, you know, the, the customer was like, man, this is never going to work, right? This isn't going to work. This, this is, no one's going to believe this. He had more shells coming in that he couldn't even type in, like, sessions, you know, to even interact with the shells because too many sh shells were coming in at a time. I think he had, like, 94 at the end of the day from the specific one. Um, that's one thing to note, too, though. You know, customers sometimes want you to do, like, large volumes of attacks. But in a lot of cases, I really only recommend targeting like one or two people at a time. And just wait. Like send it to like one person and just chill. Grab a beer or a Diet Coke or a water or whatever you're into and just wait for that person to actually click on something before you compromise them. Right? Because, I mean, if you're tar targeting one person, it's a much less probability chance of actually getting attacked or detected in that type of case. Um, so wait for one person um, and kind of wait and wait and wait and then maybe send it to a second person, wait, 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 and eventually you get to a certain point. So I'm going to go and go to this website. Let's just say I sent a, a pretext out or whatever it ends up being. There's a million of them they can come up with. Haha, <laughs> get Windows 10. Nope. We'll go to this website. And you get prompted for a quick open, right? And so if you build this in your pretext, it's great. When you go to a website, you may say, hey, you know, when you get to the website, you need to open the content to validate who you are as, a, as an organization or whatever. But as soon as you get open, what's interesting is it launches this warning banner. And this warning better is great from a trust perspective because it's saying it's signed by Microsoft, right? The author is Microsoft Publisher and it's wanting to you to open up this application. Would you trust this? Well, if it's signed by Microsoft, I probably would. Most people would, right? Now, as soon as you hit allow, oops, over here, give it a sec. PowerShell injection takes a second. And there we go. We get our shell.
So it's a very effective attack. Um, you can use it pretty much on any corporation that's using Windows. Um, if you're going after a company that's using more like um, Linux or OS X, I'd move more towards the credential harvesting type attack um, to get more from them because it's a little bit harder to pop them. Most, most uh, um, um, companies don't install Java for OS X. By default, um, Java is uninstalled by OS X, which is great. Um, so, you know, in a lot of cases, if you're just targeting Windows specific based platforms, the HTA files are kind of the way to go now. I mean, Java, um, Java exploitation is really good as well. But one thing I'll also do, um, just to kind of show you really fast, is I'll couple this attack with what we call um, uh, web jacking. Anybody use the web jacking method before? Oh, man, this is like the worst one ever. In a, in a good way for us, but bad for, for people. So let me show you the web jacking method really fast. So what I'll usually do um, is I'll send an email out, right? And I'll try to remove all barriers that possible. Okay, I'm just going to the web, web jacking vector. I'm going to hit number two. And I'm just going to um, enter my IP address in again. And I'll just clone Gmail as an example. Just because it has a username and password field on it. Now, the messed up part with web jacking is this. I didn't close that out right. That's why it crashed. But. Okay. So what I'll usually do um, is I'll create a website that, that looks similar to the company, letterheads and everything. You know, has a nice you know website type type design, and I'll say you know I'll, I'll do a pretext of whatever I want. So maybe it's uh, you know a company survey or something like that, right? And I'll say okay, make sure you're going to survey.trustedsec.com, right? If I'm attacking trustedsec, is company.trustedsec.com a valid domain that is owned by that company? Yeah, right. So if I'm going to survey.trustedsec.com, that's legit, right? So if I make a website that says Make sure when you hover over this link, it's SSL, and then it's going to survey.trustedsec.com. And when you hover over the link, it's legitimate, you know, for anti-phishing purposes. So if I hover the, over this link and I make this website look good, and I hover over this, does it? What's that say in the bottom left? Can you read that? The address bar says HTTPS colon 404 slash accounts.google.com, right? So that's a legit address, right? So if I click that link in my browser, if I'm using Firefox, I don't know if anybody uses Opera anymore. Um, Chrome or IE, should my browser go to accounts.google.com? Yes, right? <laughs> <laughs> so watch what happens here. When I click this link, okay, and this is, this is um, one of the messed up ones because it takes advantage of, of, of what we um, do in education awareness around the hover, right? We call it the hover, right? We hover over the link to make sure the link is, is legitimate before you click the link. This defeats that, unfortunately. Um, so what you can actually see here is when I click on this, it's actually going to go to accounts.google.com. The website is actually going to be there for a couple seconds, and then it's going to do a fast switch or really quick. And then we're going to be at our malicious website where we can capture our username and password, or whatever we want to do, like whether it's the HTA tag or anything else that you want out there. So when I hover over this, notice I'm not doing a trickery, right? It still says on the bottom left hand side, accounts.google.com, right? So if I click it, no hands, I'm at accounts.google.com, right? Oh, quick switch through. Notice the URL bar on the top, switch really fast. I'm actually at my malicious website. Which is 192, 168, 179, 161. Enter, this is my user. Now my password goes in, redirects back to the legitimate sites, so they never knew that was a bad place in the first place. And then over here in my attacker's machine, I get my username and password, right? I don't like hot seats. <laughs> don't like hot seats? So a very effective tactic that you can couple with other ones, right? <laughs> so you can use that in conjunction with the Java Apple attack or an HTA attack or whatever else. But what's interesting is when I do most social engineers, I don't ever use an exploit. I don't use an exploit anymore. There's no reason for me to use an exploit that may get picked up by something like a Emmet or a next gen type thing. Just use how operating systems are designed to suck. You know, use Internet Explorer, how it's designed to be bad, right? How, use Java, how it's designed to be horrible, right? You just use those types of techniques that you can use because people are going to believe whatever you do when you actually go and do it. So this one for me is probably one of the most effective ones that, that I've had a good success rate on. Now I'm going to show you another one here. I'm going to take my screen off just for a second just to make sure I can get to it real quick. And if I can't, then I apologize. But one second here. Internet's been a little flaky for me to get into the VPN. So one second here, let me log in. And let me see if I'm good. 
So Chris, do I have your permission? What's that? Well, it's just a good site. Ah, <laughs> oh, come on. All right, Chris. Um, I promise you, what I, I'm going to have you come up on stage here, okay? But hang on. I'm going to pull your your date of birth, your home address, your social security number, and a bunch of other stuff. Your full social, but I'm not going to put it on the screen. I'm not going to put it on the screen. I'm going to have you come and confirm it. All right? You're not going to pull the same thing that happened last year. What did I do last year? Not you. Someone else. The social on the screen. Oh no, I'm not putting it on the screen. I swear to God, it's off the screen. All right, hang on. Was he, what, did someone do it to you? No. Okay. Okay, hang on a second. All right, how long is this taking me? I had, I, had to, I had to log into my VPN really quick to get access to the database, but hang on a second. Hang on, is, that, the, is your uh, beginning of your home phone start with 570? Maybe. You really want me to put that here. Uh, yeah. uh, hang on. I didn't know you were that old. <laughs> really? This can't be right. This can't be right. Is that you right there? You're, are you 42? Yes, I'm 40. Yes. Is that your yeah. full social? Yeah. Okay. I didn't know you were that old, man. Congratulations. You look great. <laughs> you look good. You look good for your age. I'd be proud of that. I got rid of it. It's done. This is it. I, I, no, there's, no, there's no remnants of that. It's gone. And don't worry. I already, I, if I wanted, I had it, obviously. So, I mean... <laughs> so, um, if you don't know this, there, there are ways um, to get people's personal information and do a lot of reconnaissance on them, and that's great for getting down barriers. Like one of the things that I like to do um, if I'm targeting individuals, I'll pull specific personal information about them, like um, challenge questions or things that they may be used for security questions or things like that. Um, one of the big ones is, is social security numbers, right? Social security numbers are actually extremely easy to get if you know how to get them. Um, so I just pulled Chris's full social. It wasn't his last four, it was his full social, right? And obviously I didn't say his full social because that would have been bad for anybody in the audience. I wouldn't like that, that would have been funny, but um, he didn't want to find it funny. But, um, so I actually did something uh, recently where um, I was on a phone with somebody and I was trying to get some information from them. And what I used to get rid of um, that trust factor is I said, I just want to confirm you know, your last four. I'm, I'm going to prove to you that I know who you are and that you know, this is part of it. Your last four is this. Date of birth is this. Your home address is this. Here's your personal number here. You know, and, and all these things. And the person on the phone's like, yeah, you got it. That's cool. Great. And I'm like, okay, I need this. 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 And he's like, okay, here you go. 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 Right. So any way that you can alleviate um, any type of trust factor when you're going after somebody is very beneficial and very effective uh, for you actually uh, when you actually go on target. Um, just as an example, um, last week one of our guys, Paul, was doing a, a, a physical, and he went to this this big company, right? And they have multiple um, headquarters or multiple um, you know campuses and everything. And uh, he had his phone out, and he's looking lost and everything, and he sees an employee with a badge, and he goes up to his employee and he says, "Hey, you know, I'm I'm lost. Um, you know, do you, how do I get to the main main uh, building? Because I'm here for a job interview." And the employee was extremely helpful, as I would be too, right? If I, the employee didn't do anything wrong at all just was trying to help somebody that was trying to get to a main campus, just normal conversation, doesn't trigger anything, right? And the entire time, Paul is taking pictures of his badge, right? So he's like taking a whole bunch of pictures, right? They're looking at his badge and taking a look, look at him and seeing what's actually going on. So as soon as he did that, he went, we went to Kinko's, we, we made fake badges, and we walked right into the building, right? And you just piggyback somebody. You don't need to do a prox mark to clone a badge. You just walk behind somebody. If you have a badge, you look good. So you walk in, and you plug into the network, and then you hack away. It all comes down to making sure that you have a confidence level and that you alleviate anything that might happen with trust. And I guess that's really the, the big goal for social engineers. If you're looking at getting into this or this is something new for you, um, the biggest thing I can give you as far as tips, and I'm not the greatest social engineer. I mean, Chris could run circles around me. And I'm actually giving you a compliment, Chris. Um, I can out-code you. <laughs> um, 
but you know the, the biggest thing I can give you is that one you have to have confidence um, when you're doing your calls or your in-persons because humans can sense you know when you're nervous right if I'm on the phone I'm like uh, my my name is uh, I, I'll call you right back you know and then you know they're gonna be like why well, that dude was really weird and something's not right there right and that's how Chris sounds I'm just kidding um, but you know there's certain things that, that that give you clear indicators if you come off confident your story is believable and when I say believable the research that you did on an individual target or the company is believable you can really pretty much pull off anything you want to and it doesn't matter what that is or what you're trying to get access to in most cases if you remove those barriers by talking to a person as a human being and being positive I don't usually like using negative reinforcement for anything or negative uh, persuasion um, if, you, if you're just positive with it you can almost always get everything you want to and you have to have a very high success rate if I can, if I can research my target for like an hour or two I have a very high percentage chance of being successful of who I'm going after. And that's very, very um, hard to protect against. So I appreciate everybody's time. That's all I got. Thank you. Sorry, Chris. If we can do questions outside, yeah. there are, that'd be great. Sure. We're running. Yeah, yeah, no problem. We ran so behind on time. Uh, we have our last talk on Suggest Staying. It's all about the new fishing. We're going to release a that box for the new fishing tool. It's going to be really exciting, but a uh, huge round of applause for Dave. Thanks, man. Uh -huh. Uh -huh.